Hello, everyone, and welcome to Platwoods Church Online. My name is Evie Martin, and I'm the lead pastor here. Today, we are wrapping up this sermon series called Walk Lightly. And we've spent these last three weeks so far considering our human, and especially our Christian, relationship to planet Earth. And it's striking to me the number of people who've reached out during this series to say things like, I've never heard a church talk about this, or thank you for tackling this topic, or this is really challenging me, but thank you, I know it's important. And we framed this series to begin with the absolute gift of creation, God's gift to us. And then we named the problem that humans have caused by our presence and by our consumption of the resources entrusted to us. And then last week, we acknowledged the injustice of how climate change will create more suffering for those who are the least responsible for it, those in poverty and at the margins. We've also named that our relationship to the earth as followers of Jesus is directly tied to our relationship with God, and it's tied to our relationship with others. And now today, we'll conclude by turning toward the future. Our relationship to the earth is directly tied to the legacy that we will leave behind and our relationship with our neighbors, the ones who are yet to come. And we're sort of naturally thinking about the future already this weekend. It's graduation weekend for so many young people across the country. We're celebrating graduates right here at Platwoods Church and Worship. And graduates are the embodiment of thinking about the future. So as we're leaning toward the future, I thought we'd do something a little different today. I have invited Janessa Aston, our Director of Student Ministries, to join with me in a dialogue as we turn our sights on what lies ahead, both for our planet, but also for the people who will inhabit it. Now, neither Janessa nor I are experts in climate science or really any kind of science that I know of. No, okay. We don't claim that kind of knowledge, but Janessa, you're, let's say you're half a generation younger Mm -hmm. than I am. You've already lived um, your life in kind of a different kind of relationship to the climate than Mm -hmm. maybe our parents, our grandparents have. And you work with our students here at Platwoods Church who are, let's say, a full generation Mm -hmm. younger than me. They're the kids, they're even the grandkids to many who are listening today. So I wanted to create a space for these voices of the generations who are inheriting a hotter, more polluted, more depleted earth. I wanted those voices to be heard. So Janessa, thanks for being here today. So so excited to be here. (laughs) So tell me a little bit of your own story, your lived experience as a younger person inhabiting this earth the way it is. Yeah. So one of my like core memories was as a kid that I really remember being the thing that like set me on this like path to caring about the climate and just caring about, about the environment is bringing home a tree from kindergarten. Um, it was just like a stick. It was like a stick with roots on it, but it had a single leaf on it. And I was like, this is going to be a beautiful tree. So I loaded it up in my backpack. I took it home and me and my dad went and like planted this tree in our yard. I would go out daily and water this little tree. This was my tree. I was going to take care of it. It was going to grow up and be a beautiful, mighty tree. Two weeks later, it could have been longer. It felt like two weeks. My dad came inside and goes, I think I just killed your tree. And I was like, what? He's like, I mowed, I accidentally mowed over it. And I was like, we have to go try to save this little tree. So we took a tomato cage and put it over where the tree was. And I still tried to save this tree. It did not ever come back. No. So it just ended up being this like weird tombstone in our yard, this like tomato cage for my poor tree that (laughs) never lived. And so like this really, like I was distraught for like years about this one little, again, it was like a stick with a leaf on it, but I was so excited about it. And so like, as I then grew up, I just got like more involved in like environmental stuff. I thought I was going to go into biological sciences. Mm -hmm. So I thought I was going to go do like ecology or zoology or something. I declared a science major when I went to high school, to college. Obviously, I did not do that. Taking a different path. (laughs) Yeah, but I still obviously care a lot about God's creation. So then as I was like researching like national parks, because one of my life goals is to go to all of the national parks, um, you get then kind of into like conservation and leave no trace and leaving the earth better than you found it. And so through that led me into research about 
climate change and just like the climate that I have been living in. So one of the facts that has like stood with me for many years is that I have never experienced a normal historical average month in my lifetime of temperatures across the globe. So since 1985, there's not been a historical average month. It's been warmer than it's supposed to be. Wow, for your entire yeah. life. My entire life, like the whole time I've been on the planet. I have been living in a climate that has already changed. And so now it's just, how do I prevent it from getting mm. worse? Yeah. So my childhood was kind of marked by the reduce, reuse, recycle. Like just stop making a mess, don't be wasteful, mm -hmm. not everything is disposable. That, that was kind of my childhood. But even just in that short time, your childhood was marked more by recognizing like we've set this trajectory mm -hmm. for a, of a course for life that's not sustainable. Yeah. Like that was very much formative for you and it shaped, different, shaped mm -hmm. you differently. Can you speak to how that plays out now specifically like in your daily life, yeah. how you think about things, how you make choices and prioritize? So like... There's a lot of ways. There's little ways. Like I use shampoo bars instead of like shampoo that comes in plastic bottles. And then I have to like keep rebuying plastic. So my like shower routine is pretty much all plastic free. Mm -hmm. So like that's just a little way that I'm doing this to help save the environment. But there are bigger ways. Like I use TerraPass when I travel, which is an organization that like you say, okay, I am using this much carbon on this road trip or this much carbon when I'm flying. And then you say, okay, this is how much I'm going to buy a tree, like this many trees to offset that carbon mm -hmm. from traveling. Mm -hmm. um, but then there are even just bigger things too. Like I am asking myself, is it responsible to have kids? Like if I'm going to bring life into the world and I know the world is like on a pretty bad trajectory, is it responsible to bring new life into that? And I know I'm not the only one in my friend group, in my age group, or even like some of the older students I've worked with have, like have also asked this question. Oh. So even just like those big life-changing things. That's a big consideration. Yeah, exactly. So it also affects my job because youth ministry can be pretty wasteful. What? Yeah. Uh, I remember in high school, we did this like slip and slide with food. It wasn't like a normal slip and slide. It just had like canned green beans and stuff on it. And it was disgusting, but it was also really wasteful. And so, like, I now try to not do those kind of games. I'm not perfect. Like, we did a saran wrap ball around Christmas, mm -hmm. which is basically just a giant wad of plastic. Mm -hmm. um, but, like, I am consciously thinking about these things as I'm planning games or planning trips with students. So, like, I really try hard to not do food-based games that promote, wa like, promote waste. Um, or if we do water games, I try to do, like, sponges instead of water balloons. Oh. Yeah, instead of... I like that. Because you can use the sponges again. Yeah, and, instead yeah. of having all, like, the plastic all over the grass that's just going to, like, sit there for probably ever. Um yeah, use a sponge so we can reuse. And so I encourage kids to bring like reusable water bottles so we're not reusing single-use plastic as well. And so I also have extra on hand if they forget yeah. as yeah. well. Well, I really appreciate that you take those things into consideration yeah. even in your work. And I think it's important for us to hear that like as a church mm -hmm. and as we do programs in ministry, what are the ways that we can consciously cut out waste and be more sustainable mm -hmm. in what we do? Thank you for that. Um, I know having worked with millennials, your generation, uh, both on our church staff and in other contexts, that a lot of you are just naturally and now necessarily thinking and living in these kinds of ways um, towards zero waste, towards conservation. Um, and that's inspiring. It helps me think differently about my choices. I hope it helps others who are listening start to think differently about their choices. Um, tell me now a little bit about what you see in the generations even younger, the, the students that you work with. How are, how are they seeing the future? Yeah, so there was a study done in 2017 where this researcher went across the country and it was called 21 in America. So she found a bunch of 21 year olds, which in like 2017 would have been the oldest Gen Z kids. Mm -hmm. And so they were asked, how do you view the future of this nation, of this planet? And all of their answers were bad. Like they knew, like they know the issues that they're facing as they're growing up. So their words were things like scary 
and destruction and dumpster fire. That was like one of the top things that was said. And that was before 2020, yeah, which was exactly. the year of the dumpster. Okay. Yeah, yeah this, this was in 2017. Uh-huh. They were already seeing the dumpster fire unfold. So yeah, they've grown up and they see the future with big challenges. And like climate change is one of the biggest things that Gen Z is going to face. Mm-hmm. But then when they ask the same people, how do you view your future? Like we've heard that you view the like future of the world, not great. How do you view your own personal future? And they answered things like determined and hopeful and loving. And so they see these issues in front of them, but they're facing them with determination. So they think the future of the world is bleak, but they think my future is bright. Hmm. So like a, a gap in optimism, yes. optimism mm-hmm. gap, I think is what they call that. I, that's really interesting. And and that, um, that's really in line with our own faith story as Christians. We talk about hope a lot, and yet sometimes hope can be reduced to this sort of empty, um, cheap optimism, mm-hmm. like, oh, everything's just going to turn out all right. But that's not really, um, it's not really what Christian hope is. And I hear, uh, and what you're talking about with these younger generations, sort of traces of this raw, gritty, um, almost impossible hope. Mm-hmm. And it's the same kind of hope we hear about in Paul's writings after the resurrection of Christ. And as the church is sort of being born, it's this sense of knowing deep in our core, um, in spite of everything around us, which honestly feels hopeless, that there is the possibility of life and beauty yet to come. I hear that both in Paul and, and I hear it in what you're talking about with young people. I think specifically of an image that Paul gives us in Romans chapter 8. He's talking about the suffering that he sees all around him. Of course, there was suffering in his time. There's suffering in our time now. And while the sources might be different, the human, human experience of suffering is the same. But he connects that experience to the labor pains of birth. That's the image that he gives us. He says this in Romans chapter 8. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we ourselves groan inwardly while we wait for adoption, for the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience." Now, Paul obviously wasn't writing specifically about climate change, although his letter is certainly relevant to our modern problem. But what's important for us to hear in this is this holistic understanding of the hope we can have for the future. It includes all of creation. In fact, the earth itself and all created things, humans included, are groaning for it, he says. We and the animals and the plants and the rocks and the oceans We know there is the possibility for a fuller life in God's vision. And even when things seem grim, we yearn for it. Our young people yearn for it. We insist that it can and that it will be because we are the firstborn of the Spirit. We are the ones with the power to enact such a future. And I hear you saying that these younger generations are leaning heavily into that kind of hope, hope against all odds for yeah. the future. I think Gen Z, like they see and they feel this tension that creation is eagerly waiting for us to do something. So Fuller Youth Institute put out this book a few years ago called Three Big Questions That Change Every Teenager. And the three questions focus around identity and belonging and purpose. And so this question of purpose is one that I love exploring with teenagers like specifically, um, because if you spend any time around teenagers, you know they ask like a million questions. A middle schooler can go from like a ridiculous question to a really serious question in one breath. And so, like, I just love exploring purpose with them and, like, seeing the world through their eyes. And so, and around this time, seniors are really starting to ask themselves, like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do with my life? And so their questions on purpose can really be summed up in this one question, which is, what can I do to make a difference? And so, so many students start asking them, like, what is God's plan for my life? Or where do I fit into God's story and for my life? Like, 
And so throughout my time in student ministry, I really tried to remind students that Christ-centered purpose comes from knowing we are invited into God's greater story. So like the part of God's story that most students right now are finding themselves a part of is the creation story. Mm. So they feel this like creation is eagerly waiting for us. It's groaning for us to do something. They have heard the earth say, hey, uh, something is wrong. <laughs> and so they further the plot of God's creation story by getting involved in creation or like um, conservation efforts or picking careers that lean more towards sustainability or green careers as yeah. well. Can you say a little more how you see that playing out in the lives of our own students right here at Plantwoods? Yeah. So we have a senior this year who has declared her major as environmental science. And she also did her senior internship at Parkville Nature Sanctuary. So just like right in our backyard. Yeah. And out of all of the internships, that was the one that she picked. Yeah. We also have a fourth grader who's gotten really involved in his school's um, recycling club. Mm -hmm. Again, it was just like, pick a club. It's like, I'm going to do recycling. recycling. And yeah. that... Yeah, he's just super involved. I think he might be like the president. I could be wrong, but <laughs> I think I know who you're talking about. And he's he talks about this a lot. And yeah. he's even drawn pictures and created some marketing materials, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, I see this, I see the same thing in my own son, who's 10. Um, and he lives with just a totally different understanding of his place on this planet and how he needs to live on it. He's already thinking a lot about like alternative energy mm -hmm. sources and he has ideas on how to modify the robots that pick up the plastic out of the ocean. So like, who knows what he's going to end up doing. Perfect. Um, but he also has completely different sources and outlets yeah. for influence and for this idea of making a difference, ways that he sees himself being able to make a difference. I told him we were going to be doing this sermon series and I asked him what he thought we should talk about. And he went straight to one of his favorite YouTubers. Mr. Beast. Yep. Do you know Mr. Beast? Sure I don't know if anyone out there knows. I, I did not. Um, but Zeke told me, Mom, you have to show them this video. And he pulled it up for me. And Mr. Beast, who has like eight bajillion followers, went on this social media campaign to plant 20 million trees. Um, it's a really fun video. I, I think they did it. I think they achieved it with the help of the Arbor Day Foundation. 20 million trees. But there's just this totally different way of learning about and affecting change for the environment that these generations coming behind us have. Yeah, so 56% of uh, Gen Z have reported that they've seen info on climate change on social media like every couple of days. So like this is like every week, 56% of Gen Z are seeing something about climate change on their social media, media, whether it's through YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, whatever it is. And then with how the algorithms work now, as soon as you interact with something like Mr. Beast and his 20 bajillion trees or whatever <laughs> that he planted, um, you're going to see more info about that. And you're going to see more content like that on your feeds. And so um, it's just like they're inundated with information about this. And then they... There's just this huge range of emotions when they see those things because they see things about climate change and think, oh my gosh, the world's never going to change. So they have this like anxiety around it or they're mad that like not more is being done. But even still, they have that hope that we talked about earlier and they feel like motivated to actually do something by these posts as well. Yeah, yeah. So the last couple of weeks, we dove pretty deep into the reality that surrounds us with regard to climate change, um, and it's not a pretty picture. That's, that's pretty clear. Um, the projections and the outlook for the course that we have charted are, scientists say, leading us steadily toward a three-degree increase in our atmospheric temperature by 2100, the end of the century. That's not an extinction of our species. Four degrees would be. But it's going to be a really difficult and brutal life for billions of people, for animals, for the earth in the next 80 years. And it's really easy to throw our hands up and give up hope. Like you say, we have all these emotions around it. Um, but as people of faith, and particularly after the example and for the sake of our students, we, we look for signs of life and hope. And the good news is there are, there are some. <laughs> I, while humans have collectively made a mess out of a lot of things, humans are also really amazing and creative creatures. And so there is reason to hope that we can actually change the trajectory of the future for these generations to come. For starters, just a few points of hope here. There are many, but I'll just lift up a few. This might seem simplistic, but I think it's extremely important. Um, we have named the problem. We've named it. 
The International Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, puts out a report every few years to help advance knowledge on the human-induced problem of climate change. And just last year, for the very first time, the 195 nations who receive and assess this report unanimously agreed on the findings. That's awesome. Like the fact that 195 <laughs> nations can agree on anything is kind of astounding. And it might be easy to say, well, okay, that's great. It's about time, but it's now too late. I think we still need to celebrate the moment of progress. I agree. Because like, as we know from um, the field of mental health and anxiety, we can't tackle a problem until we've named it. And once we've named the problem, now we can begin to work towards solutions. Another piece of good news is, <laughs> take it with a grain of salt here, the next 80 years of human existence are not going to be the worst case scenario that we once thought. Basically, the future is going to be bad. It's just going to be less bad. <laughs> so if we can take that as good news, we will. That may not sound wildly hopeful, but we have to remain honest about mm -hmm. the mess we've gotten ourselves into because we do have to act. But what's good about the outlook is that we're not, we're not facing extinction as a human species. There will be an inhabitable planet for our children and our grandchildren to inhabit. And if we're on track for a three degree temperature increase by 2100, that means that every fraction of a degree that we can lower that reality, the more hopeful the future becomes. It makes a difference. And this gives us reason to celebrate what I said just a moment ago, that humans are amazing creatures. In spite of the fact that governments and big businesses, corporations, those entities with the greatest responsibility and the greatest power to affect change have been largely ineffective at actually doing anything, um, humans still care. Really smart, really passionate, really creative humans care. And they're doing stuff anyway. <laughs> People with influence are changing the way their companies operate. People with resources are developing clean technologies like electric planes and solar arrays that float on the surface of the ocean and carbon capture and zero waste products. Many humans, not all, but many humans are doing what we are created to do, to create, to imagine, to cultivate a world that continues to bring forth life. I think that's really good news. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of stories this week about people doing these remarkable and life-furthering things, and one that really caught my attention is about a woman in Thailand. She's an architect named Kochkorn Vorakom. That's how great my Thai pronunciation is. <laughs> but when she was a child, she, uh, she liked to pull apart cracked pavement in Bangkok to let the seedlings burst through the concrete sprawl of the city so that they could grow. And now she's a landscape architect who works with Southeast Asia's mega cities, these massive cities over there, to design cracks in the concrete, concrete that are the size of parks. So she designs these massive urban parks which function basically as lungs and reservoirs for the cities. So they allow the cities both to breathe and to absorb and store water from the worsening storms in that region. I just love that That's story. That's awesome. Humans are like capable of ingenuity that puts life at the center of the choices mm -hmm. that we're making. And there's also just been really cool things happening in like the life of PWUMC. Like um, one of our church members' nephew, he works at, for a demo business, and his community or his like company was tasked with getting rid of stuff in a KU dorm. Like they were just gonna mm -hmm. like gut it. And he saw all of these like beds and nightstands and like sheets and everything and saw, I don't wanna, I don't wanna put that in the trash. Mm -hmm. So he reached out to, I think Brandy and like all of our partner organizations. And we took all of that stuff that was destined for landfill and we, our partner organization, Della Lamb can use that to help house refugees mm -hmm. as they come to our area. And so also this month, our Saturday Go Serve was really focused on nature. So we had people picking up litter across the city. We had people planting trees throughout the Northland. Um, because of this sermon series, our IT provider at our church said, hey, 
uh, we want to do an electronics recycling event so we can keep those things out of landfills. The preschoolers in Kid Connection this month are also learning about creation. Um, we didn't plan that. It's just <laughs> that's how it happened. Um, and then last week we gave out 75 trees to be planted. Yeah. So I got to help in that process. I was just like in the lobby. I was like, hey, how can I help make sure people get trees to take home? Thinking about the tree that my dad yes. had mowed you over. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it was adorable to see like grandparents and parents take these. Again, they were just like little sticks. Uh -huh. But they took them and said, this is going to be a tree for like my grandkids or my kids. Like they were thinking about future generations as they were taking these trees. Yeah. yeah. I love that that image of a tree. It's such an important one, uh, especially for us as Christians with an eye toward a biblical future. Our story begins in a garden. Pastor Chung Ho started us off with that, uh, that text in the first week of this series. But our story ends with a tree, too. The very last chapter of the Bible, Revelation 22, gives us this image to ground our hope for the future. Here are these verses. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations." I think it's profound that the Bible gives us this vision of a future which is a tree of life nestled right in the heart of a city. Somehow, the future holds the possibility of the civilization of humanity in absolute harmony and balance with the beauty of the first garden as God created it. And the fruit of that garden offers life and healing for all of creation. It's an image that holds life at the very center. It's a vision that guides us toward regeneration. And regeneration, I, this is an important word, it's a theological word. We use it to explain what happens to us when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of our hearts. We regenerate, we experience a second birth, a new life inside of us. Life begets more life. Life is at the center of what God is doing in us. But regeneration is, ironically, also becoming an ecological word. More and more people are looking toward a future of regeneration in agriculture, in energy science, in daily living. And the same meaning holds. A future of regeneration means that we start putting life at the center, that life can be reborn out of life again and again. We start making life, new life, more life on the grounds. That becomes the grounds for all of our decisions. I don't think it's a coincidence that the ecological and the theological future of our world is the same, regeneration. So we have, we have the solutions. We have the biblical charge. We know what to do. We make life the basis of our daily actions and choices. And now we just have to do it. Yeah, and I think some of us are already doing yeah. those things. Yeah. Like we're already putting life at the decision making center of like our like our process without even really naming it. So I know a lot of people who carry around reusable straws. Yeah. Um, because they saw a video one time about a turtle with like a plastic straw stuck in its nose. And so then it's like, it nope, them. we can't. I, I got to save the turtles. And so it's putting life at the center of the decision of like even over something so simple as a straw. Mm -hmm. So it's reframing how we think about sustainable practices around caring for the lives around us. Like bringing my own bags to the store isn't just because like I want a cute tote bag to hold my groceries or whatever. It's a way I can love the lives around me. Because for me and people younger than me, like Gen Z and Gen Alpha, it's about the earth I am living on as I get older. I will see the long-term effects of climate change in my lifetime. So putting life at the, like the center of my decisions means I am thinking about my friends and my family so we don't experience climate catastrophe. We will just experience climate change. Mm. So for me and loving my neighbor and like my current and my future neighbor, it's taking those steps to mitigate 
climate change. And those things aren't just necessarily things like reduce, reuse, recycle, which is tossed around a lot when you talk about sustainability and conservation efforts. And it should be because it's a really good place to start and it's where most of us start this journey. But taking steps to mitigate climate change are things like advocating for large scale change. Mm -hmm. So we talk about the future of the environment. It can't just be what we as individuals do. There are 20 companies in the world that contribute to 50% of the single use plastics in the world. So to center life around making decisions means like how do we buy things? So there, like my favorite example of this is Colgate makes one line that's in aluminum bottles. So aluminum is infinitely recyclable while plastic is not. So I choose to buy the mouthwash that's in aluminum because then it shows them, hey, I want you to keep making these things. I pick products when I see things in the store that are made from recycled materials to show there's a market mm -hmm. for this thing. So it's showing companies there's a market for the sustainable options. And so it's slowing down to make these choices as well. Like, do I really need the random object from Amazon the next day? Or can I wait like a week, which is still not a long time, so all of my things that I ordered that week can come in one box opposed to multiple plastic mailers. Mm -hmm. So also voting for people who have like actual plans and actual action items when with the climate is another huge way we can center life in our decision yeah. process as well. And that happens at every level, local mm -hmm. all the way to national. Yes. Those, those votes count, yeah. Yeah, there are so many practical actions that we can take every day. And, and I want to add one more that is unique to people of faith. I want to add prayer. For many of you, this is an obvious answer. Of course, we should pray about the health and the future of our planet. And for others, you might be thinking, well, what good will that do? But prayer changes people. To begin with, it changes us. When we start praying about something, it stays present in our mind all the time. And so it changes how we are thinking about and how we are acting in the world around us daily. So prayer changes us. But the Spirit of God has also been known to change people in power. We can pray for regeneration, for rebirth in the hearts of other people, that those with significant influence and power will also come to cherish life and flourishing above profit and personal gain. There's power when we pray for change. We can't control it, but we can hope for it. We can believe it's possible. So when I teach students about prayer, um, we talk about habit stacking. So what are the things in your daily life that you already do? Mm -hmm. Or like, not, if it's not daily, like something throughout your week or that you do pretty often. And then how can we add something else on top of that? So like, it's a formula. So you do a certain habit, I will pray this way. So when I water my plants, I will pray for God to help me care for all of creation. Mm -hmm. Or when I read the news, I will pray for my elected leaders and take like that they take steps to care for the planet. Or when it rains, I will thank God for the rain and pray for those people experiencing extreme mm -hmm. drought. Or when it's really hot, I will pray for people who are experiencing extreme heat. Mm -hmm. So adding something something that you already do, mm -hmm. already experience, adding your prayer on yeah. top of that. That's really helpful. Janessa, we have covered a lot today. <laughs> and we've hardly scratched the surface of these challenges, these really complicated challenges facing us in the future. Um, but the reality is these are not the challenges of the future. Mm -hmm. They're the challenges of now. You are the face of the generations that are gonna bear the really painful burden of the effects of climate change. And when we act to love our neighbors of the future, we are thinking of you and the students that you work with and our children and our grandchildren. So thanks for helping us find these glimmers of hope, but also to help us find our place in God's story, that even now in our actions, our choices and our lifestyles, we can make a difference. We can make changes that put life at the center and that bring about that future that all creation is longing for. So will you, will you please close us in prayer today? Absolutely. God, we thank you for your creation. We thank you for the trees and the birds and the mountains and the oceans. Lord, teach us to be good caretakers of the earth that you have entrusted to us. Show us ways that we can hold life at the center of all that we do so we can better love our neighbor.
As we look for glimpses of hope, as we look towards the future, will you be with all of the young people graduating in this season? Guide them in their choices and may they continue to look towards their futures with great hope and optimism. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.